Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God a whole lot. But so do you. You need Him more than me. (laughs) I can tell by looking at you. You need Him a lot. I mean, a really lot. So come on, stand to your feet. Let's go before the Lord. And let's ask Him to bless this time. Father, we need help. (laughs) <laughs> and we just give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor as we come in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Make our petitions known unto you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Holy Spirit, you are the teacher of the church. We haven't come to hear from a man. We haven't come to hear from a woman. We haven't come to hear from a young man or an old man or a tall man or a short man. We haven't come to hear from a black man, brown man, white man. No, we don't do that here. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. We love you. We're grateful that you're here. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. How grateful we really are, Lord. We're just appreciative. Now, Lord, we would ask tonight that the word of God would become alive on the inside of us. And as you bless us with your word, we would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel tonight, Lord. They're gathered in other areas and other churches, Bible studies, wherever they're at. They're hearing about Jesus. We want you to bless them as you would bless us. There are brothers and our sisters. We don't think of ourselves as better than anybody, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together, one field building, one kingdom. Not a man's, but yours. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, get your Bibles and go with me, if you will, to Philippians, the fourth chapter. Here's our verse, if you will, that we started off last week with in Philippians, the fourth chapter. Kind of a cool little verse in verse number seven. It makes this statement, and it says these words in verse seven. And the peace of God. I I, I tell you what, there's all kinds of peace in this world. You can find peace in, you know, in your home. You can find peace in your job. You can find peace Uh, with uh, whatever it is that you're looking for, even with your kids, you can imagine that. But you can find peace, the one peace that surpasses all understanding is going to be found in God. And he makes this statement, and if I may share it with you, it says, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. How deep is the peace of God that literally surpasses all of our thinking? Goes beyond. In other words, I can find peace because, you know, my checkbook's cool. Or I can find peace because my job's going well. I can find peace because I found a little hope on the inside. Things are happening. Things are good. Car's good. House good. Wife loves you. That kind of stuff. I can find peace. Kids are doing great. I find some peace. Take a deep breath at night. Lay my head down the pillow. Fall asleep. And that's a great peace. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I want you to know the peace that surpasses even your thinking. How deep is that? How great is that? And it's called the peace of God, not the peace of this world, not the peace that comes with, you know, things working well on your behalf. But can I just say this to you? Not everything always works well on your behalf. Has anybody ever noticed that? I mean, it's like, come on. I mean, we're Christians. doesn't mean, you know, we're so insulated and isolated from the world that we don't have any problems. We, we all have problems. Even Pastor Deborah, me, everybody on staff, we all have problems. Somebody just needs to admit that to you. Sometimes we come to church and we act like we got it all together. Can I tell you something? Without the Word of God, uh, we don't have it all together. Someone needs to admit that. In other words, I'm anointed to preach the Word of God, but I'm not any more anointed to keep it than you. Are. I have got to hear it, receive it, p- apply it in my life, or it isn't going to work. But this peace that comes from God surpasses even my thinking. Wow! And will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. That's, that's pretty exciting. And last week when we were covering this subject, we covered the subject and it said uh, how and why 
Christians fail at uh, receiving and having peace. And I, I, I thought it was interesting because we as Christians, if anybody have an insight to God, have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us, we ought to live at more peace than anybody else. Didn't say there wouldn't be times of trouble and tribulation, problems and pressures. Jesus even says, I have overcome the world. You'll, in the world, you'll have trouble and temptations and tr pressures. But I've overcome the world. Be of, then he comes along and says, be of good cheer. So why Christians have no peace? And we gave you four things. Just want to rewind it just for a minute. Is that okay with your thinking? Four things. Number one, here's why they have no peace. It might be you. See if it properly evaluates you. Number one, listen to this. They fail, listen to this, failure to evaluate properly. In other words, you look at a situation and you put the wrong context on the situation. You're evaluating, you're placing a value on something that should not be the value. You were, oh, hear me, never, remember how I said this last week, you were never designed by God to find a lasting fulfillment in the things of this world. Never. And we keep looking to the things of this world to bring us peace, you know, satisfaction in marriage, satisfaction with kids, satisfaction with home, business, jobs, retirement programs, whatever it might possibly be, school, school uh, college education, getting better grades, whatever it is, we're always looking somewhere in this physical world for peace that doesn't last. And that's why we talked about it. We improperly evaluate the situation. And that's why you see so many rock stars killing themselves. You know, they have everything. They got fortune and fame and money, and they're overdosing one after another of drugs because they can't find that peace they're looking for. So they're using a, a substance to bring some kind of relaxation to their life. When in fact, the one that brings relaxation, that peace, rest, if you will, into the soul is only from God. Then that kind of peace surpasses natural thinking. In other words, here's what I mean by that. You should be upset. You should be frustrated. You should be falling apart, but somehow you're just not. I can't tell you how many times there's been a funeral on somebody who has lost a loved one, and then you meet the family as a pastor over the last, you know, 30 some odd years. Uh, you meet the family, and you're, uh, you're really inside kind of afraid of what to expect. Some people just fall apart. But you'd be surprised how many people are strong and healthy. Why? Because they're Christians, and during that period of time, we find this peace that surpasses all understanding. They ought to be falling apart. They just love, lost a loved one that was so close to them. They ought to be failing in everything. But somehow there's a peace on them. That's the very presence of God. But the idea is not just to have that peace in times of, you know, temporary trouble, but properly evaluate the situation. And that means if you don't look for the right thing at the right place, you're not going to get the right results. Second thing we found out last week is a failure to hear. You know, you can preach and preach and preach and a lot of people hear the voice, hear the noise, go to church, but really don't get it. Hearing is when you get it, not in your head, but in your heart. It's called, in the, in, the, in, in the New Testament, it's called epinosis. That means knowledge in the Greek word, which means comes alive. When it becomes part of your system, epinosis. So that when the word is being preached, it's not just pre and preached, it's noted, and you remember it until Monday, and then you don't remember it any longer. It becomes literally part of your life. I always use the illustration of tying my shoes. When I was a little boy, my dad would tell you, go like this, go like this, you pull this thing, and you pull it tight, but you gotta pull it tight, son. You know, and so when I put these shoes on, even tonight, I didn't think about going like this, going like this, grabbing this, grabbing that, pulling it tight. I just automatically did that because my mind was somewhere else, but I was so conditioned to it, it became part of my life on how to tie my shoes. In the Greek word, that's a word called epinosis. So there's a lot of people that hear but don't hear. Are they, you know, they hear the sound, but they don't get it. They come to church, they don't get it. I was telling uh, today somebody, there are people that attend the rock, and I can tell by the way they listen, I can't help them. And it's the saddest thing in the world. I, I can't help them because uh, they don't hear. So their failure to hear oftentimes will keep us from, listen to this, from responding properly and properly evaluating, number one. So we find out, number two, failure to hear. Number three, we found out failure to remember. You know, when you learn a lesson, you've got to remember it. You can't forget it. 
And sometimes we forget things. We're, we're human. It's just part of the way life is that we, we forget all the time. Number four, remember this failure to act. You can't just be a hearer. you got to be a doer. So you can get this, but you still got to do it. I can't just preach it and not do it and get away with it. Well, I, you know, he's blessed and therefore he preaches this. He's, and if I don't do it, I hate to use this as an illustration because there's, for every one bad one, there's 10,000 good pastors. But have you ever known a pastor that failed? Here's why. Because he could preach it, but he didn't do it. And that's the difference. And for every, every like I say, for every one bad one that's gone astray, there's 10,000 solid, healthy ones that are in there. And we thank God for that. We want to look to that when we use pastors as illustration of something negative. But I'm just saying, here's this. You can preach this. You can learn this. You can quote this. But until you get to the place where you're doing it, it doesn't work any good. And can I just say it like this? Um, talk's cheap. Don't tell me, show me. Is anybody listening? So well, in Christendom, we find a lot of that, don't we? Where the talk's cheap and uh, show me stuff. So I find myself preaching this last week. And uh, I had an experience about six hours after I got home that literally robbed my joy. Can I share it with you? First of all, in order to share it with you, I'm going to have to show you about a year ago, I bought my wife, Deborah, a little puppy, such a good little puppy. He's a uh, Yorkie poo, and just as cute as can be. Can I have a picture of, of the good dog? That's him. His, his name is Linus, and he just looks like that all the time, and he's just, just the cutest thing in the whole world. And I have to tell you something, I, I'm a big guy, you know, I'm 6'5", weigh 200 pounds, and uh, about uh, 30 pounds more than I should. And I'm a big guy, you know, and I've never had a little dog in my life. I've had big German shepherds, you know, and sheep dogs, and big, you know, uh, what are those big dogs called? The one that Bogey, what was Bogey? He was St. Bernard jumped through the screens in my house when I yelled. And, uh, uh, and so, I mean, I've always had these big dogs, but I never had a dog in my life in the house. Never had a dog in my life. Don't know how to deal with dogs that are little. And I used to always think that men that walk a dog that looks like that, this guy is about this big, by the way, okay? And even, you know, I never, I never, never had an experience with a dog in the house, never had an experience with a little dog this big, and I, I, I never could ever see myself walking this dog, you know what I mean? There's just something about, doesn't fit here, you know what I mean? It just doesn't fit, it didn't come fit. And I find myself at times walking this dog. I, 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 I like this dog. You know, and uh, it's amazing how much attention this dog gets. When I walk, nobody looks at me. Everybody looks at the dog. Nobody waves at me. They'll go, hey, cute, I cute, I cute. I shut up. What about me? And, um, <laughs> you know, and so <clears throat> I preach the gospel. I, I preach what I just told you about, right? About peace and why people don't have peace. And uh, I find myself in this predicament. Uh, Deb and I go to bed that night. Man, I'm tired. It's like, you know, at my age, I'm pushing 70. So I, uh, you know, at nine o'clock at night, I'm, I'm, I'm finding myself tired. I, you know, you young guys stay up till 10. But um, <laughs> nine o'clock and I'm tired. So Debbie likes to stay up and watch television. So I talked to her to getting into bed and she got in bed and we watched television for a little bit. And then Debbie fell asleep and, uh, you know, and I turned off the TV and went to sleep. I remember exactly because I have one of those clocks next to me and it says 3.20 in the morning. It's horrible, horrible, horrible smell. <laughs> horrible smell. Now, I forgot that the dog sleeps in a bed upstairs with us. Now, he doesn't go poop in the house. Well, not too often. And when he does, it's kind of cute. It looked like little Tootsie Rolls. <laughs> You know, it's like, he left you a Tootsie Roll to clean up, Debbie. <laughs> tootsie Roll. I mean, who can be mad at a Tootsie Roll, you know? <laughs> and so I, it's, it's like 3.20 in the morning, six hours after I fell asleep. I mean, it stinks so bad. Now, I have a bed that's real high, so my feet don't hit the floor. Uh, and so it's not like, so I'm sitting up, the, I sat up in bed, you know, I got like this, and I'm sitting up in bed. 
like this going, oh, the smell. Oh, the smell. And I'm looking back at Debbie. I think maybe I have to cast a devil out of her or something. You know what I mean? But then I realized she doesn't do those things. And so I'm... Um, Oh God, am I in trouble? Am I in trouble later? So anyway, so I'm going, she says to me, I wake up and I'm sitting there on the edge of the bed like this. I'm going, wow, man, something really stinks. I said, do you think that dog pooped in the house? I didn't use the word poop. I was at 3.20 in the morning. I'll say what I want to say, you know what I mean? And so... So, wait a minute, wait a minute. So, I, I'm going, you think? She says, oh, man, I don't know. So, the truth is, is I said, well, I'm going to turn the light on. So I jump out of bed. <laughs> I'm talking barefoot, right? This was not Tootsie Roll. This was the devil himself pooped next to my bed, my bare feet, and it caught all across the front of my toes. It went between my toes. I'm going there, oh my God, Debbie! Debbie! Now it's, my toes are filled with dog poo, right? I got my pajamas on. I'm going, oh, I don't know what to do. So I, I lean back on my heels. I'm back on my heels, because I can't put my feet down. It's going to be all over. So I'm on my heels, walking at 3.22 in the morning. I'm thinking, what am I going to do? That stupid dog, that idiot dog, what, what are you doing, you dumb dog dog? Dog, let's see bad dog look. Can I show you the bad dog look? That's bad dog look. I just, I just went poop next to your bed. You just stepped in it, and I'm real sorry, but I didn't know how to not do it. And I tried to let you know that's how I was close to your bed trying to tell you I have a problem. And I'm telling you, so I, I'm walking on my heels. I didn't know what to do or where to go. And I just felt like, oh my God, I'm gonna go take a shower. So I can't take my pajamas off. You take your pajamas off, guess what goes all over your pajamas? At 3.24 in the evening, I'm in the shower with my pajamas on. I'm like livid, man. I am like lost my peace. And all of a sudden, God speaks to me. And he says, what did you just preach six hours ago? And I thought, oh, come on. True story, honestly. And he says, okay, what do you do? And that's what we're going to talk about. When you have lost your peace. In order for you to fully understand the story, let me show you now. I've shown you a good dog. I've shown you the bad dog. Let me show you the only wise, perfect dog. Check it out. That's the one you buy. That's my grandson, Bjorn. Next, one of my grandchildren. I had 10 grandsons. But that's one of them right there. And so anyway, here it is today. It's kind of fun on how to get your peace back. Are you ready? And I, can I just tell you this up front? I did all of this, and it works. So if you listen, when you have lost your peace, and I believe you will, I think we all will from time to time, and that's part of being a human. The object is not to lose it and keep it and constantly filter through it. The object is how to get your peace back and move on in life. Number one, acknowledge your loss and your need. I'm in the shower. I'm saying, God, I can't believe I lost the battle of my peace. God says, very normal. But Lord, I need your help. Ah. In other words, what I'm saying, if you don't acknowledge where you're at, you'll stay where you're at all the time. 
If you don't acknowledge that you have a problem, you'll never correct the problem. If you don't acknowledge you have anger problems or anger issues, how can you ever work with anger problems or anger issues? If you always see it as not a problem and everybody else has a problem, you, you, can I just say something? You will never change because there's never going to be what you need there to change. The desire to change starts with the very first step of acknowledgement. Acknowledging who you are and what you need. And I said, God, I have lost my peace. I'm in the shower, 324 at night. I have lost my peace and oh, Jesus, I really need you. And some of us live life completely with ever acknowledging where we're at and what we've done wrong and want to make a correction. You'll never make the correction in your life until you want to make a correction. You'll never make the correction until you acknowledge where you're at. Whatever problem you have, whatever it might be, without peace, with peace, anger, whatever frustrations you might have, anxiety, whatever situation you live in, insecurities or whatever it is until you say that's the way I am and then you need to do something about it. It starts with acknowledgement. When I realize, God, I have lost my peace and I really need your help. He was doing something. He was teaching me this lesson tonight. In the shower with soap on my feet, <laughs> teaching me for you. So funny. I find it interesting. There's this book, just if you will, Lamentations. I will read the third chapter, verse number 40 to you. In fact, I'll pop it up on the overhead. So you have to acknowledge. Let us search out and examine our ways. Didn't say examine everybody else's ways. Didn't say point the finger over them. Didn't say look at them. They did this. They made me mad. They screwed up. They failed. They did this. That stupid dog. Robbed my peace. No, the dog just did what he does, went poop. The peace left because I operated in something different than what I could have operated in. I operated in anger and then lost my peace. Examine your ways. And then he makes this statement that's really wild. We ought to underline this way. And turn back to the Lord. Wow. In other words, check out where you're at. It doesn't work until you check out where you're at, and it doesn't work until you turn back to the things of God, which is really an interesting thing. I was teaching a Bible college class the other night on uh, Thursday night, and uh, we were talking about David. He was probably at the lowest point of his entire life. He's now just about, you know, 28, 29 years old, been running from Saul for years. He's been prophesied over to be the next king of Israel, and nothing has worked out for like maybe 10 years, 10, 12 years. Nothing. He's running for his life. Nothing looks like it's true. I mean, he's probably doubted everybody. He's run out of Israel. He's found himself in the hometown of Goliath, trying to take up refuge there, and he finds himself, and you really check the scripture, you'll see uh, chapter after chapter chapter he never refers to God at all and then finally at the low place in his life where his men are wanting to kill him and he's lost everything in his life something happens in first Samuel the 30th chapter if you got your Bible you might want to go there in verse number six let's just pop it up in the overhead and so David was greatly distressed have you ever lost your peace and you feel distressed for people spoke of stoning him because of the souls of all the people were grieved and every man and his sons and his daughters, but David strengthened himself. See these words? I should have underlined them for you. David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. In other words, may I say something to you? Until you come to a place that you need a need and your need is going to only be fulfilled in God, it will never be fulfilled by God. You have to hear what I just said. Until you come to a place where you have a need that can only be fulfilled by God, it will never be be fulfilled by God until you acknowledge you have a need from God. And so he strengthens himself. In verse number eight, he goes to God. He says, what should I do? And David said, he said, these, that's seven, go to eight. Verse eight, it says that David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I pursue the troops? Shall I overtake them? The answer was pursue, overtake, without fail, you'll recover all. And he did. In other words, you've got to acknowledge what it is you are at, 
and where you're going. Second thing, we're going to find out on how, if you will, to get peace back. Number two, listen to this. Bring Jesus in. If you're a Christian, there's only one you can bring in. You can't bring in the parties and talk to them. You can't bring in the people who frustrated you. I can't discipline that little dog. I, 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 I can't do much about that. I mean, I take him downstairs and put him in his cage, which I did, left him there all night long, which he needs to be, and he's been there ever since. I did feed him yesterday. And uh, no, I, I, no I, I'm kidding for those of you that, that are, you think I'm not kidding. I'm just kidding. But here's the deal. You you can't go after the problem, you go after Jesus. And until you, listen to this, bring Jesus into your marriage, bring Jesus into your children, bring Jesus into your finances, bring Jesus into your job, bring, you'll never find the peace that you need to. The, the antidote for your pressure is Jesus. Is everybody listening? And so that, for all of us in here, you're going to have to bring Jesus into the situation. If I, if I may, in Matthew, remember this, the 11th chapter, verse 28 from last week. Stop thinking about it just for a moment. Pop it up on the overhead. Matthew 11, chapter 4. Come to me, all you labor and heavy laden. And I, here's a promise from God. I, I should have highlighted the words, I might. No, I, I may. No, I, what, will give you rest. I will give you rest. But you've got to come to God. You've got to make him the source of your peace. It's a peace that surpasses all understanding. It doesn't, can I just say this to you? It doesn't happen because you preach the word. It doesn't happen because you're a nice Christian. It doesn't happen because, you know, you got Jesus tattooed in your upper left arm. I said that because of San Bernardino. And uh, I, I, it doesn't happen because of that. You know, it happens because you're going to bring Jesus into the situation. Listen to my, my friends. I want to tell you something. Whatever problems you're facing in the future that has the potential or has already robbed you of your peace, the solution is only found in Jesus. And until you bring him in to the decision-making process for your future, you will never be successful. Are you hearing me? Come on, somebody. If you got that, say amen. The third thing, but by the way, which I did in the, in the shower, I'm like, you know, I'm not thinking straight this time in the morning. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing it. I'm just frustrated. I've got my pajamas on. I'm soaked. I, you know, I've got soap between my feet. I don't know if I got them clean enough. I'm sitting there cleaning them and cleaning them and cleaning them. I mean, this is like super gross. You know what I'm saying? It's awful. And so I, I had to bring Jesus into it. Jesus cleansed me. And the best part of it is he brought my peace back because listen to what it, number three. Number three is this, give it. I had to not only bring him in, I had to give it to him. In other words, I could bring him in and hold it or I could bring him in and give it. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You didn't get that. I could bring him in and hold it, which we do all the time, and then we wonder why it doesn't work. I had to give it to him. In other words, I had to do something. I like what 1 Peter 5, 7 says. Just pop it up on the overhead. It says these words, casting all of your cares on him. Speaking, notice the capital H in the word him there. Jesus, who cares for you. No one cares for you more than you're going to have to give your cares to Jesus. You can't just acknowledge him. You can't just bring him in and not give it to him. And a lot of times when we have a problem, here's what we do. Listen, listen, listen. Here's what we do. What we do is we bring Jesus in, but we never release the problem to him. And he can't work on it until you give it to him. Why would he work on something he doesn't have? And you're still holding on to it. And you hold on to it because you don't have any faith. Oh, I hate that because it's just the way it is. But it's true. You're holding on to it because you really don't believe he can do anything and doesn't want to do anything. But notice what it says. He's the one that cares about you. You've got to cast your cares. I like what the Word of God has to say. Let me just pop it up on the overhead because I'll just give you another reference on this. And I thought it was pretty good. Philippians 4, 6. And it says this. And I love this. Tell me this isn't cool. Be anxious for nothing. In other words, man, I wanted to go back to bed. Man, I wanted to get a hold of that little puppy and knock him out. <laughs> Be anxious for nothing. In other words, 
hey, I got to get up in the morning and work. I need this rest. Can I tell you something? If God's in your life, you don't need anything but God. I need to eat this meal. Did you know the children of Israel made that same mistake? They said, well, why doesn't God feed us? You know, manna has to fall from heaven. Do you know the presence of God would have sustained them without food? You're going to tell me God's going to let them die? The proof of that was Moses going to the top of the mountain for 40 days without food or water, communicating with God. Wait a minute, you can't live 40 days without food or water, but in the presence of God, you can live 40 days or as long as you want to live. God would have sustained the children of Israel, listen to this, without the natural substance that they were desiring. We always desire the natural substance to get us back to where we want to. You will never accomplish anything spiritual by looking to the physical. Is anybody listening? You will never accomplish anything spiritual by looking to the physical. You have to look to the spiritual and realize that that's where it's going to come from. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything in prayer and supplication, I'm praying to God in the shower. God, I need help. I'm really angry. And I was even kind of mad at God, if you want to know the truth. I just got through six hours before that, six hours and 26 minutes before that, preaching the gospel. I was tired. And I'm in the shower at 3 o'clock in the morning. i got to get up and meet all the people i got to meet with and have all the meetings and run all the, the stuff that I run. And I'm thinking, i got to get this rest. Guess what? It isn't in the rest. It's in the God. I don't need the sleep. It's in God. I don't need the food. It's in God. Whatever I need, God will give me. All I have to do is go to God and get it. But until I give it to God, it doesn't work. Be thankful with thanksgiving. And it says these words. It says, but in everything, even, can I just put it like this? Circle if you have everything in your Bible and put even dog poo poo between your feet. <laughs> Please don't write that in your Bible. When you die someday and your kids read it, they're going to say, boy, was mom or dad nuts. And so don't write that in there. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You gotta bring God in, and you gotta three, give it to God. Number four, I love this. Here's the last one for tonight. So much fun. Cast down wrong thoughts. Because I could have, from that moment on, had an evil idea about that dog. Get rid of the wrong thought. I could have laid in bed the rest of the night worrying about not having any sleep. Ha! Huh. Immediately, I just got rid of it. I gave it to God, got back into peace. Everything was going well. Came out of the shower, dried off. My wife was on her knees cleaning up the poop. That really helped. <laughs> she scrubbed it all up, cleaned it all up. I mean, I got a great wife. And she helped me to clear my thinking up, and that's what a help me does. It helps you to clear your thinking. You know, can I just say this? You can acknowledge the problem. You can bring Jesus in, and you can give it to Jesus, but until you clean the soul and keep it cleaned, it's apt to come back at some other time. And that's the problem with so many of us, is we don't really cleanse the palate of our thinking at all. And here's what the Word of God has to say about that, which I, I find fascinating. It says these words in Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a great prophet who's crying out over Israel and the failure of Israel. Jeremiah, fourth chapter. Verse 14 says, Oh, Jerusalem, wash your hearts from wickedness. Every day, every one of us have problems with people. Every day, we have problems with the dog poo of your life, whatever it might be. Every day, somebody will do something wrong. Some situation will happen. Something's going to take place. And it says, oh, Jerusalem, wash your hearts from wickedness. Notice that we didn't say, God, wash my heart. The job of washing the heart is yours. The cleansing of the palate of your soul is your responsibility. 
You don't stand before God and say, oh, and these are the stupid prayers of the 70s and 80s and 90s. Oh, God, give me peace. And God's yelling back, I've given you peace. Oh, God, cleanse me from this evil way. I've already cleansed you. Keep yourself cleansed and the wicked one will touch you not. First John 5, 18. In other words, the responsibility of how clean your heart is, that means your thinking is your responsibility. Because he goes on, he said, what, that you may be safe. How long shall your evil thoughts lodge within you? The people failed, my, my friends. We're different. We're learning from their failure. How long will those evil thoughts, how long will the wrong kind of thinking about the problem, how long will you hold somebody in account? How long will your peace be robbed from you because someone hurt you? Or will you finally give it to God and let it go and take it to him and rid yourself of it and cast down imaginations? 1 Corinthians, sorry, 2 Corinthians uh, tells us, cast down imaginations that exalt themselves above the knowledge of God and bring in captivity every thought to the obedience of God. In other words, it's your responsibility to get it out of your thinking because until you get it out of your thinking, I could have laid there all night long being angry at that dog. Some of you lay all night long angry or frustrated about stuff and you can't sleep at night because stuff, you got to give it to God, you got to let it go and you got to cleanse the soul. Come on, somebody. So we're talking about peace. We're talking about peace. Can I just give you a final to the whole story? This is a true story. I went back to bed. Debbie washed her hands real good and, and her knees. And we got back in bed and I fell asleep. Slept the whole night. Didn't think about the dog dreamt about Jesus because I had brought Jesus into my life. And that's the source of peace. We don't live there. We live in our own little world of frustration. And we never acknowledge. We don't bring Jesus in. We don't give it to him. And we find ourselves never cleansing our souls and getting it out of our thinking so we never think about it again. When you've given it to Jesus, never take it back. If God spoke to you tonight, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Yeah. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. Some of you haven't given your heart to Jesus. You know him in your head. Okay, no problem. But the devil knows him in his head and he's not going to heaven. So the fact that you celebrate Easter and Christmas doesn't make you a Christian. The fact that you say you're a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. I mean, you can call yourself a fish, go sit in the water in the ocean, and after about two weeks, you'll be nothing but a slimy human, never going to be a fish. So what you say about yourself doesn't make you what you are. Jesus said these words, you must be born again. Now listen to me, listen, listen, listen. Everything I taught tonight, everything you see tonight, it starts with this, starts with this. Without this, nothing works. Going to church doesn't work, praying doesn't work, uh, you, you know, giving money doesn't work. Nothing works without starting with this. If you want to be blessed in the future, you're going to have to follow the orders of Jesus and become part of his family by being born again. Born again means something. I know we in Hollywood have done all that stuff. They've made it, made it horrible. They've, they've made it uh, like a born-again person's an idiot. But that's not what Jesus talked about. Born-again means this, that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. It's an all-or-nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. All or nothing. Let me say it again. It is an all or nothing relationship. You cannot have a half in, half out relationship with God and expect you to be born again, headed for heaven. It's not going to work. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, a book of Revelation, you've heard of it. Jesus himself is speaking. He says these words, I'm coming again. 
Now we know he's coming again. We don't know when, but we know he's coming. And he says these words, when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Oh my goodness. What did he just really say? He said, people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all and they're not going to make it to heaven. They're going to get vomited out of his mouth. What's lukewarm? Little in, little out, little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Watch this, watch this, watch this. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And he'll never be something until you make him everything. And that's what born again is, is you give God and you've got to give it to him. All of your heart and all of your life. He's not a thief to rob your heart, it's yours. He's not a conniver to hit you in the head with a two by four, make you do this. He's not a manipulator to manipulate your heart and life. It's a free will choice that you make to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. That's the beauty of Christianity. It's not some legislated, you know, we cannot legislate in any means the gospel. It's all got to be from the heart. It's all about the heart. We can't do it any other way. So you getting right with God is about your heart. Will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life and make him Lord and Savior of your life? That's what this is all about. So you can't come along and say, well, I think I'm good enough to make it. You'll never be good enough to make it. That's not what he's looking for. That's not how you make it. How you make it is whether you're born again. And the only way to be born again is to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Lionel, sit down. Get out of the way. You're so big, you're blocking half the back section standing there. My goodness, the guy looks like a wall. And all the people behind him can't see a thing. I'm talking to you back there. That's why I'm having him sit down. You need to get right with God by giving God all of your heart and giving God all of your life. Tonight is your night. We've laughed, we've sung, we've clapped our hands, we've prayed for each other. Now, for those of you that are not right, tonight is your night to get right. You've seen God move in mighty ways tonight. God spoke to you tonight. Don't miss out thinking you're a Christian because you can't think your way into heaven. You gotta make sure by giving God all of your heart. Tonight is your night of salvation. Now here's how it's gonna work. I'm gonna count three, pop my hands. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up, I'll see your hand go up, you put it right back down, that's simple. Just go bang! When you hear that, your hand goes up, you're saying, I want Jesus, I wanna to go to heaven, I don't wanna to go to hell. If that's you, then guess what? Then tonight is your night of salvation. You put your hand up, put it right back down, that's simple. Or you sit there like this, but he said these words. Jesus said, if you deny me, I'll deny you. Whew. Tonight is your night. Get ready to pop your hand up. Who should raise your hand? You've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. If you've given, not given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people in here, listen, listen, listen. That's not sure. Sure, that's okay. But let's make sure. Tonight you're not. You say, Pastor, wait a minute. If I have to raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. But isn't it better to be embarrassed in a safe place like this for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees? Come on. Nobody's that stupid. Tonight is your night. And tell the devil to go take a flying jump at the galloping ghost because you're not going to hell with him. And you're going to go to heaven, and tonight's your night. I'm going to count the three, pop my hands together. You let me see your hand and put it right back down. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Back here, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Thank you. 14. Thank you. 15, 16, 17. Thank you. Back over here. There's 18. Thank you. There's 19. There's 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Back in the family room, 25. Thank you back there. I'm thinking there's one back there. Anybody else? There's 25 wise people. Anybody else? 
Anybody else? There's another one back over here, 26, and I already got that one, so that's 25. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 25 right here. Okay, here's what I want you to do. All 25 of you, not going to embarrass you, so this is it. You raised your hand, you're serious. Anybody that should have raised your hand but didn't, you can come to. All 25 of you, get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. Listen to the instructions. Listen to the instructions. Remember, people don't get it because they don't hear. I want you to hear this. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. Get out of your seat. Get in the aisle. No one leaves the building while the people are coming forward. I'll dismiss you in a moment. Let's get the people in the aisle up here in front. And then uh, we're going to give you something. We're going to pray with you. You're going to love it. And no weird stuff goes on. You won't be embarrassed. If you raise your hand or you should have, get your stuff. Get out of your seat. Bring a friend if you need to. And get up here. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Just as I am. Okay, you guys, all of you in the front row, look to your left. See this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor B, like A B C, Pastor B. His real name is Becker, but we call him Dr. B around here. So Dr. B is a good guy. He's going to do three things. One, he's going to pray with you. Two, he's going to give you something free. You need to know what it is. Take it home and read about what God wants you to do next now that you're a Christian. And three, I love this part. He's going to introduce you to a program we have to help you get strong in Jesus. We care about you, love you. We want to fight with, with you and for you for the future. Guess what? It's going to be great. Let us help you get strong. So make a left turn. Follow Pastor B right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me. And then he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins. That I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.